Um, a sad one to start with, as some of you will know, one of our oldest founder members, Michael Mansell, also known as Fruity Hatfield Peveril, sadly died a few days ago. Um, Fruity was a founder member of the Sheridan Club. He carried the flag at one of the early Chap Olympics, you may remember that, dressed as a RAF officer. He was also a DJ at the Candlelight Club for several years. Uh, although he uh, very much a club stalwart, uh, he became a bit of a recluse in recent years, um, partly due to ill health. Uh, but uh, he did uh, show up occasionally on Facebook and came along to, I think, the Lush Luau party uh, reasonably recently. Um, anyway, we, we shall certainly miss him. I shall, I shall miss his chats. Yes. He was always, always happy to tell you what, exactly what he thought of everything <laughs> and to tell you why your opinion on everything was complete nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> also good. Um, he came across as a bit of a curmudgeon, but uh, I think we all knew that he was a very kind and loyal friend at heart. Um, just finish with a quick anecdote. I was supposed to be having lunch with him once with some friends. And he rang my mobile and said, oh, I'm really sorry. He said, I'm stuck on a bus. The traffic's terrible. The road works. I looked at my phone and I said, Fruity, you're calling from your landline. You haven't even left the house. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so... Yeah, that's Fruity, all right. Yeah, so... Never know me on time for anything. Raise a glass to, to Fruity. To Fruity. Fruity. If that wasn't sad and depressing enough, uh, there's, some, there's some club activities coming up. <laughs> we have um, the annual pub crawl coming up on the 13th of November, organised by Ian, wherever he is. I think it'll be in Blackheath and Greenwich this year. We have the virtual pub quiz on the 17th of November as well. Candlelight Club, 19th and 20th of November. Tickets available, I assume? Yeah, both nice. Very good, very good. 19th of November, I think uh, Mark Gidman is uh, talking at uh, Time for Tea, something like that. Tea House Theatre. Tea House Theatre, sorry, talking yes. Talking Yes. And, of course, we have the Christmas party on the 4th of December. Uh, the committee is still meeting in smoke-filled rooms to decide the theme. Well, planning to meet in smoke-filled rooms. Planning to meet, yes. <laughs> yeah, we, go, uh, we can organise this for you, if you like. <laughs> the smoke-filling. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. And the next meeting, monthly meeting, will be 1st of December, where Sam Mardi Meldiabad will talk about ancient Greek music and other stuff. <laughs> Anyway, tonight's speaker is Luca, who will talk about three outrageous notions you were warned about in school. Okay. Good man. Good man. So, over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about three issues that have been tackled by very erudite and much smarter people than myself for about a few centuries. So we try to cover that in 45 minutes. So it's not a really serious endeavor, but uh, we'll try. So this is a fun quote from Mr. Keynes. Education is the inculcation of incomprehensible into the indifferent by the incompetent. <laughs> he was always worth a good, funny quote, but uh, you know, there is a point to educational orthodoxy. So we all have some basic facts and assumptions that we share. Otherwise, it's very difficult to uh, carry on a conversation and reach any kind of conclusion, as we've noticed, I think, in the last four or five years in most countries. But uh, sometimes some of the detail is lost, and it's, I think it's a pity. So I'm going to talk about three notions that uh, are generally taught if you know, undergo the process of uh, um, formal education. One is that, and they're in order of obscurity, <laughs> sort of less obscure. <laughs> The first one is that you know you shouldn't really say things like barbarian invasions or the Dark Ages because that's poor historiography, it's complex, blah blah blah. The second accepted notion is that beauty is basically subjective and generally depends on time and place. And the third orthodoxy is that correlation is not causation. You must have all heard that a million times. 
of these things are completely false, but the outrageous notions that I'm going to try to advocate today is that actually there were dark ages in Europe. Um, there is, the more we understand about human neurology and the evolutionary uh, framework of it, the more we, we come to, we, we should be able to accept there is some objective basis to aesthetics. Objective, at least in the sense that something that touches everyone, if not necessarily objective in a purely metaphysical sense. And lastly, um, I'm going to try to convince you that correlation may not be exactly the same thing as causation, but it's a big, big part of that. So let's start with the Dark Ages and the outrageous notion you were warned about to think that actually such a thing existed. Okay, so uh, I'm talking about the first thing we'll, we'll talk about is uh, technological change. And when I use the word technology, being an economist, I use it in that sense. It's not just um, things and tools and techniques, but it's the way we organize things. So think, for instance, of crop rotation. You know, you can be a farmer with the same tools as another farmer. If you engage in crop rotation, you have a higher yield, typically. Uh, there is no technology in the material sense, but it's a way of thinking. So th these are examples of actual technology, you know, the traditional sense of the word, <coughs> things. And these are some very useful soft technologies, things like marginal reserve banking, or multilateral <laughs> trade, <laughs> or crop rotation. <laughs> Is multilateral trade funny? <laughs> Nobody or, knows! Or <laughs> contract law, things like this, right? Depends things that, what's true, you know, my dear. Yeah, true. Um, you know, they're, they're things that make things work better for a given set of scientific knowledge that you may have. I'm also going to talk about some social metrics that people of our time and period seem to think are important, like you know, the, the degree of social mobility and certification, rule of law, diversity of opinion, intra-group violence, intergroup violence, education, and so forth. So I'm going to judge that period from 500 to 1200 based on what happened to technology and what happened to those metrics. <laughs> it all starts, so I'm not going to spend any significant amount of time talking about why it all went pear-shaped, uh, but obviously there's a crisis in, 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 in this large area of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa that starts in the third century, uh, you know, in one word, or two words rather, imperial overreach eventually, but lots of things happen at the same time, including some environmental ones, and the net result is that it all broke down, and a bunch of new ethnic groups and people and cultures and, and civilizations, well, civilization is a big word, I think, for those people, but, but you know, <laughs> move through cultures, I'd say, it's a neutral word, move through and change this whole Mediterranean basis and Western Europe for hundreds of years. So, you know, we got the Goths, <laughs> the Vandals, the Lombards, the Jutes, the Huns, the Scots. They haven't changed! And of course, the Anglo Saxons. Um, so things change. So let's look at some technologies that were almost universal in the classical age, in the sense that you could find them throughout the Roman Empire and, and some of the you know, surrounding areas, certainly the Parthian or Persian Empire, the Middle East, and so on. And in that period of 500 to 1000, they weren't completely absent. You, know, you could find some examples, but they were vanishingly rare things. Concrete, glazed ceramics, aqueducts, paved roads, multi-story civilian buildings, fresco, realistic sculpture and paper, portraiture, paper, papyrus paper, plumbing, sewers, complex bridges, the list goes on. Large cities, dredge ports, Latin sails, you know, basically almost everything that uh, could create a sophisticated civilization. Oh, Forgive me just absolutely. a second, you mentioned multi-story buildings, but multi -story, civilian, buildings. Uh, uh, civilian buildings are well recorded in, uh, oh, what was it, Ramesses II, the building of the Great Pyramid, um, people were housed in multi-story buildings, right. like laborers, and they were not slaves, they were laborers. No, right, so the point is that it existed in the classical times and pre-classical mm -hmm. times, but between 500 and 1000, very few multi-story civilian buildings were built. Ah, oh, thank right? you. So before that, they were commonplace, right? Every Roman city had multi-story, usually for housing and commercial purposes. And after that, uh, you know, for hundreds of years, basically, you could try to build one, but it would fall down. So the only things that it was worth investing that kind of technology in were basically churches and maybe some palaces or castles. You obviously had multi-story castles, but they weren't very livable. Um, so those are hard technologies that were 
I won't say completely lost, but became, went from being commonplace to, to being gone, you know, a bit like toilet paper at the beginning of COVID. And before everyone had toilet paper, we never thought about, you know, what will I, you know, clean myself with, and then it was difficult to get. Apologies, that was my wife. <laughs> Some soft technologies that became, went from being almost universal or very widespread to being extremely rare, writing, professional jurisprudence, you know, no courts anymore, you just go to the chieftain and, hopes he, and you hope he likes you. Uh, or your wife, at least, or your daughter. Um, secular general education, long distance payment, messenger services over long distances, secular books and pamphlets, most of the philosophical and scientific knowledge of the classical age, long distance multilateral trade, insurance, theater rather than people sort of going around telling nice old stories, but actually you know, stage theater in a theater with seasons and playwrights. You know, that was gone for six, roughly 600 years in Europe. The impact of all these changes are visible in things like demographics. So this is the population of the city of Rome. Obviously, that's a biased sample because it was particularly large and then it only kind of recovered at that level in the 20th century. Um, but the population of Europe as a whole, now obviously these figures are, are you know, very wild estimates, uh, but I think that the order of magnitude is right. Um, you can have a big drop in population for things like the Black Death, but you recover quite quickly. Uh, this is centuries of slow decline in the overall population of Europe. One of the problems with low population isn't just the numbers, which you, know, you could argue that, you know, is it really important to have you know, 600 million or 300 million people living in Europe? But when you have a lot of people, you get urbanization, as you did uh, during the pre-collapse period. And when you have urbanization, you have specialization. You know, it's difficult to get specialization in terms of the arts and sciences and government and philosophy for if everyone lives in a little subsistence village. So you have huge cities, huge cities that trade with each other and communicate so that an invention here very quickly reaches here and then here. You know, you have that kind of effect. So trade is something that completely collapsed. Um, in the pre-collapse period, you had long distance trade and it was massive trade. It wasn't just, you know, purple from Tyre, you know, for the king. It, they, they traded commodities. They traded actually, I think they actually traded marble and stone, okay, which is a really heavy, relatively cheap thing. Uh, tin from gold, <coughs> etc. Yeah, and so tin, for instance, is fairly specialized because tin is found in a lot of places in Europe. So that was traded even in the Bronze Age and it continued to be traded during the, uh, the Middle Ages. But that kind of super specialized trade almost never completely collapses. But you had much more widespread trade, and of course. Trade allows you to take advantage of comparative advantage uh, as opposed to autarky. And it's just estimated that in a pre-industrial society, widespread trade would generally improve consumption potential, so purchasing power, if you will, or roughly 50%, so it's pretty substantial. There's also long distance trade, not directly generally, with India and China in the pre-collapse period. This basically died out. And we can see that from the number of shipwrecks that are found. Um, also industrial production, what, what, what there was of industrial production, we can measure ancient uh, lead pollution and things of that sort, um, you know, coin finds and so on. You know, it just, it just pre-collapse you find goods and currency, including some fairly specialized, uh, unusual things from the Middle East, you know, near Adrian's Wall. That's a long distance in those days. That kind of trade just dies out. Big impact on learning, of course. Um, I mean, again, these estimates are very, 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 very rough. But it's, it's, it's thought that I think they're a little bit high, personally, in this chart. But certainly well over half the people pre-collapse could read and write. And that number was not really reached in Europe until the 19th century. And for, for most of the so-called Dark Ages, other than a few priests, basically, almost no one could read or write. Mm -hmm. You know, there were people that were pseudo-judges and chieftains and military leaders that couldn't read or write. Um, a striking picture of the pre-collapse is, is this one here. Because she's a woman, probably yeah. patrician, but yeah. not necessarily of, of imperial uh, extraction. And she's going to write, okay? People learn to read before they learn to write. You know, this disappears from our continent, from our civilization, again, for centuries. You know, the idea of some woman that could write it was just laughable. I mean, you know, um, why would you teach her to write? And, I mean, she's just a, and she's wealthy. She's got earrings. She's got a headpiece. She's, she's, got, she's probably patrician, but it, it wasn't just it wasn't just um, 
it wasn't just uh, limited to the very, very top of society. I would say probably the top 50, 60% of society. Um, there were plenty of slaves that had been right, especially if it was part of their job, obviously. Um, there's also something interesting that happens with social mobility because obviously, you know, you can't compare the social mobility of ancient Egypt or, 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 or Greece to modern days. But when you do have a complex society of specialized jobs and, and therefore specialized competence and knowledge, it is possible for someone that isn't born in the very highest echelons to make their way up. And we see that with traders, with scholars. They're often famous ones, not necessarily from the patrician class. Uh, feudal society was particularly stratified. It was very close to a caste system. You know, you could be a warrior, you could be a priest, and then there's everybody else. Uh, and, and those everybody else could almost never make their way up, especially in the initial uh, part of the Middle Ages. You know, crime statistics obviously weren't kept as assiduously back then as they're kept now, partly because no one could write. Uh, but um, the level of interpersonal violence, certainly, we have some reasonable um, um, records from parish records from the late Middle Ages onward. Um, and it's generally accepted that, uh, you know, there was a lot more interpersonal violence during the Dark Ages. And I think that even though we don't have the figures, I think there are two reasons to believe that. First of all, the monopoly of force of the state was very diffuse. There wasn't, you know, one state in, you know, in, in Britain or France since at least the 1400s or the 1500s. Uh, there was only really one set of people that could legally kill you. Um, in the early feudal society, there are many, many layers, you know, like all kinds of local chieftains can kill you and each other. Uh, it can challenge each other to duels freely. You know, you have trial by combat and things like that. The other reason to believe that it was considerably higher, the, the interpersonal violence rate, is that contrary to what most people seem to believe for reasons I've never quite understood, is that lower population density generally means more per capita violence. Cities are less violent than the countryside. Obviously, if you have a city of 12 million, there are more murders than a village of 12 people. But per capita, Low density population tends to be much more violent, and of course, the Middle Ages were, you know, the poster child of low density. Not causation. <laughs> it's just fewer, fewer cops as well. You also have a lot of intra, you know, in, you have intragroup violence, but intergroup violence, and, 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 and that's basically, you know, the, the classical age was full of warfare and violence. But once you fracture polities into hundreds, and, and this is a wild underestimate of the number of different fiefdoms, kingdoms, and dukedoms that could reasonably fight against each other in full-on warfare. Uh, you just get more, more war. And I would argue, and I think a lot of historians that are clever and better informed than me would argue that the cultural heritage of this, of European nobility being ruled for you know, two or three hundred years by Germanic barbarian chieftains uh, took you know centuries to kind of leak out, leach out of European culture, a very warlike culture. So you know, most societies, uh, I would say most healthy societies, or certainly most pre-postmodern societies, tend to value some degree of martial prowess. Uh, but it's not quite the same as what happened in Europe during the Dark Ages and stayed in Europe through the early modern period. This idea that the only real form of nobility is a man on horseback that kills a lot of people. You know, that's, that's, that's the super top um, caste. You know, the priests are useful, you know, the, you got to keep them on side, but really, you know, the real winner is somebody that goes around lopping heads off, almost certainly from horseback. So that's actually from that silly show. Well, that's um, Game of Thrones, I believe. I've never seen it, but that's... So, who you'll be familiar with this stuff. Obviously, there's some people are preserving the light and keeping some of the information, and later it leaches back into Europe in the later Middle Ages. Constantinople and Byzantium, the Near East, especially the Abbasid Caliphate. And there were pockets in Europe. If you look at the Romance Crescent between northwestern Italy, southern France, and what is now Catalonia, you know, the, the barbarians came through quite fiercely, but Roman law and, and culture and architecture was a bit more, um, disappeared less thoroughly there. Obviously Charlemagne and the monasteries eventually. And then eventually the Dark Ages come to an end because people are clever and ingenious and they learn from each other, including uh, you know, Byzantium and the Near East. And 
there was a real agricultural and technological revolution in the 1200s and the 1300s, and then later there's also more political and, and um, philosophical and uh, social progress. It starts in roughly 1000, but it accelerates from the 1400s. And so the Dark Ages do end. But I do think that by most measures, it's ridiculous and, 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 and very silly and um, It just goes against all the facts to think that there wasn't such a thing as the Dark Ages and barbarian invasions in Europe. There were. Uh, so what, how do they end? Traditionally, people have said the Renaissance is the end of the Dark Ages. I think progressive romanticist people think that maybe the Dark Ages really only ended with the French Revolution spreading the Enlightenment through Europe. And some people think the Dark Ages are still there. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm afraid I'm afraid most of the jokes were in the first of the three bits. Uh, okay, so beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, the second outrageous notion is that actually there is quite a strong objective physiological basis to what we perceive and experience as beauty. So I think the insight that has been useful in this beyond the usual sort of talking back and forth philosophy of the 20th century is more recently is this better understanding of cognitive duality. You've all have heard of system one and system two. You know, system one is when we just experience things and think of them and you use heuristics and it's very quick and it's effortless. And system two is when you have to sit down and really think about something like multiplying large numbers or designing a new house or trying to get out of Ikea. You know, you have to kind of, it's difficult. You know, it takes planning, right? And once we understand that that's how people think, whether we'd like them to think like that or not, and certainly the, the classical philosophers thought that, that, you know, they thought it was all system two. You know, these were just idiots, animals, and women thought like that, but your know, proper Greeks thought like that. Well, no, that's not true. Now, a lot of dichotomies that have been debated endlessly in philosophy, especially moral philosophy, um, I think can be uh, unpacked a little bit. You know, so nature versus nurture, individualism, collectivism, and so on. And the one we're going to talk about today, of course, is objective beauty versus subjective aesthetics. This is a side note, because this is, I mean, I think everything up to now you, you all already knew, so it's just a good laugh, but uh, aesthetics origin, nowadays when you say aesthetics, we, we, say, we mean the study of the concepts and the theories and, and philosophy of beauty. Originally, it meant one theory of beauty. So you know, it was, it's a very recent word, it's from the late 18th century, although it's Greek sounding. And it means the idea that uh, the perception of beauty is a purely emotional and personal experience. Originally, we had, I'll talk, there were thousands, hundreds of theories of beauty, but the two main ones are, the first one is the great theory of beauty, which started in classical periods in the 5th century BC. And, you know, there are lots of different offshoots, but the basic idea is that both visible, and, and, by the way, you see how by linguistic sh shift, some of these words have come to take a very, a more, a more general meaning in our language, but you have visible beauty, beauty, symmetry, and audible beauty, harmony, and they are based on ma almost mathematical ratios of proportions, of string length, of, uh, you know, the amplitude and the vibration of the different notes, and so their idea was that, you know, we humans are, you know, are imperfectly clever, unlike God, but, you know, the more we study this, the more we can discern these rules, and the more we apply these rules, we can create beauty almost like, like an algorithm, okay? Um, so there's a very top-down, reason-based concept of beauty, and in incidentally, initially, it didn't apply to nature, it was only man-made things. But it's a very rigid concept, and I think very prescriptive concept of beauty, and so it became challenged. Uh, very early in the Renaissance, you know, people would point out to the fact that you know, beauty is one of those things that, you know, I know it when I see it, but it's difficult to define precisely. Uh, and the death knell of, of taking beauty as, in such a strict way as the, um, as the classical philosophers did was the analytical revolution of the 16th century. Because once you start analyzing every single word and statement and, and the aphorism in language, you realize that phenomenal, phenomenologically, you can punch a lot of holes into the classical theory, to the great theory of beauty. You know, it doesn't apply 100% all the time, so therefore it can't be true by analytical standards. And the ultimate work on that, which I think for a lot of people just put, you know, after that work, basically a lot of people just stopped writing about aesthetics or thinking about aesthetics, at least in philosophy, was Kant's critique of judgment. 
his view was beauty is, you know, you can't define beauty as an objective external reality. It's just what we perceive as beautiful. And uh, what we perceive as beautiful is, you know, we know varies a lot between people and it varies between cultures. And so it's, it depends on, on what we call taste. You know, we acquired a taste because of what we're exposed to, what's explained to us, perhaps, you know, there are some associations, whether they're personal ones or ideological ones and so on. And so that is a quite a strong critique, I think, quite a successful critique of the original great theory of beauty. On top of that, in the late stage of uh, the Enlightenment, you obviously get the Romanticist movement, and the Romanticist movement is almost the flip side of the great theory of beauty. You know, beauty is particularly true in nature. Man-made stuff is, you know, pale imitation. And the Romanticists perceive a lot of beauty in things that are irregular and strange and vital and picturesque and even terrible. And so this idea of romantic sublimity, which I think undermines from an emotional point of view or maybe an ideological point of view, the great theory of beauty, but also Kantian relativism, uh, it makes it very difficult to think of the great theory of beauty as being still solid. It really undermines it. So that was a kind of quantitative almost. You know, beauty is this, and you know, we haven't quite fully defined it, but it's definable. It's, it's like a clock. You know, it's very complicated, but if we know the parts, we can make it work to a very psychological, experiential concept of beauty. Now, the consequences of that prob problematization of the idea of beauty is that, of course, you know, if proportion, you know, if 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 there is no objectivity at all in beauty, then let's just keep messing with the proportions, the verisimilitude until we get avant-gardism or abstraction first, and avant-gardism, the idea that if you produce art that people like, it can be very good. Uh, and then eventually conceptualism, conceptual art. You know, what is art? What I say is art. You know, this is art, this is sculpture. Um, because I say it is. Um, why not? It's, it's subjective, right? You can't tell me it's not art. Uh, I feel it is. I feel it's beautiful. It pisses you off, and I like to piss you off, so I like it, and I think it's beautiful. That's conceptual art, basically, in one sentence. May I cross you on that? that. Yeah. At the Chelsea that. Arts Club. You know, the, 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 Tracy Emin had this problem with her. She lost a cat, and she put a uh, lost cat poster up, and people steal posters. And yeah, they, they, they stole it because they thought it was art. She said, no, shit. I'll tell you what art is. That's art, but not that. You know. Well, you mean her, her bed in a little well, uh, ball, yeah. uh, so a then, ball, yeah, so ball that you could hang from a Christmas tree? Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's yeah. perceptual, conceptual. It's more performance, sorry. But yeah, I mean, and all that leads to what I call, well, not just me, but um, programmatic inversion. This idea that, you know, in, in the great theory of art and the early days of the Enlightenment, you know, there's still an agreement that one of the purposes of art is to ennoble things that we care about or just give us a sense of beauty and tranquility and repose and, 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 and happiness. And from the late 19th century onward, the avant-garde certainly, and I think more and more the general population comes to believe that the, pro the point of art is to you know, wake us up, to make us challenge certain assumptions, to, you know, to unsettle us. And you're not you're not supposed to feel comfortable when you look at my art, you know, says Tracy Ammon. You're supposed to have a reaction, but not, but not a sense of delight or comfort. Screw that. Right? Now, how do, how do these two, how do these two um, theories fit in? We're going back to this idea of cognitive duality. Well, the great theory of beauty is based on a, on, on a worldview, on an episteme that believes, I guess, all current evidence, that we just think the system one. We, we can be, or maybe we're not all the time, but we can be perfectly logical, pro programmatic beings. And it therefore results in a lot of you know, biases that, that are damaging to finding out and defining it and trying to you know, perhaps expand the concept of beauty. The worst one being confabulation, which in cognitive theory is the idea that first you come with a conclusion, you know, uh, for instance, my, one of my instinctual conclusions is that Gothic buildings are pretty and they're interesting and they're, they're great. And then you come up with a lot of, the more learned you are, the more architectural history you learn, the more history you learn, the better reasons you can come up with why that's true. But you start there with a conclusion, that's confabulation. Um, the aesthetic theory of beauty also, though, has some issues. The first one is that confuses the fact that system one is more powerful and more available with the idea that it should be, it shouldn't be. If we only work with system one, we'd have never built anything. 
Yeah, that's would be animals, right? If you only work with system one, the crime rate would be tremendously higher, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the classical thinkers are wrong to think that we could be all system two. But the romanticists especially, and, and many members of the Enlightenment seem to think that, you know, system two is difficult, screw it, let's just do system one. Well, I'll just do whatever comes natural. Well, that leads to other heuristics and biases. This idea that, you know, I like this, so it must be nice, it must be beautiful, or you must have heard this before. You know, that woman isn't really beautiful because, you know, I, I, I don't like her, and, you know, only a nice person can be beautiful. No, that's, that's the worst intellectual sin, you know, in linguistics, it's conflation. You know, you can't define everything you like as beautiful, you know, and you can't define everything beautiful as something you like necessarily. There are other, there are other characteristics. So they both have problems, and I guess they need to be integrated, they need to be, needs to be a synthesis. Interestingly, this man, who I think was probably one of the lesser known, I would guess, but, um, but more, more outstanding members of the British or Scots Enlightenment, among other things, he taught human atoms and was taught by Salisbury. Um, but um, he looked at this in, in some depth and he wrote a very interesting book, a uh, pamphlet really, uh, you know, inquiring concerning beauty, order, harmony, and design. And, he, he did subscribe to the aesthetic theory of beauty, you know, that beauty wasn't some kind of formula that the gods had decreed and you just needed to find it out and apply it. There was a great deal of subjectivity and difference, or at least that there was a lot of phenomenological um, holes into this kind of idea. There's one beauty and it's this and, you know, that's it. But it was a more subtle critique. Uh, so he thought that, and, and Kant thought that too, that humans have an innate sense of beauty but he also thought that that wasn't just a sense of this kind of sense of delight, but it was related to some, to some degree with harmony and proportion. So that's a bit closer to the great theory. So he's basically saying it's a mix. It's a compromise. It's a bit of both. Uh, and that what we perceive as beautiful is partially associative. So taste, what we're taught, what, we, what, we, what, we, you know, what we're used to. Uh, and there's great, a great deal of evidence that what we'd like tends to be associative, you know, what we grew up with, what we thought was nice. Um, but also to some degree um, linked to, you know, there are certain things that across time and across space, maybe not in precise mathematical terms, but in broad terms, hold true. Like morality, this was Salisbury's point, right? Like different societies have different morality, but there aren't a lot of societies where it's okay to burn down your neighbor's house, you know, kill his dog, rape his daughter. Generally speaking, almost all societies think this is a bad idea. They mostly differ into what the in-group is, right? It could be just 10 people or, you know, the whole world if you're a modern progressive. Uh, but within the group, you, should, you should, really shouldn't do those things. Uh, so just like that, morality changes, is different, you know, and people have opi different opinions, and, but there's a core to it. And so he came up with a concept which I think, again, linking it to modern neuropsychological findings is, is a great is a great little sentence. It's uniformity within variety. So the beauty contains a balance between order and predictability versus uh, surprise and, and, and delight in, in you know in differences or chaos and discovery and familiarity. Linking this back to um, to what I was just saying now about neurology um, you know, we've got an autonomic nervous system, and that's the reason why our heart keeps beating and we keep breathing in if we're asleep, or if we're passed out, or whatever. And uh, lots of very important things, our digestion and so forth, are regulated by this without us even being aware of it. So it's very, very, very deep system one. In fact, it's not even cognitive, so it's pre-system two, so it's system zero. Within that system, there are two um, subsections which are closer to our consciousness, they're partly subconscious, but, but you, you can think about them, you can conceptualize them, you, don't, you, know, you never really think very long about your heart beating, um, you know, unless your doctor is kind of trying to find out. The first one is the sympathetic system, and I think the most obvious example of the sympathetic system is I remember once running, when I was younger I used to run, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was in the Midwest, and, and I heard something rattling, and so I just jumped four feet that, that way without really thinking. That's, that was my sympathetic system, because you don't want to step on rattlesnakes. Um, in a modern, sophisticated, or urban society, we don't get a lot of rattlesnakes. And that's why people, but our sympathetic system needs some stimulus. 
That's why people like horror movies, right? Or jump scares, or uh, you know, bungee jumping, and things like that. So we need some of that stimulus, the variety, to use, <laughs> right? To use, to use Hutchison's phrase. We also have a parasympathetic system. And the parasympathetic system is using pattern recognition, and we need that to help our system too, because it helps us concentrate and focus, and, and not just kind of take everything in, but, you know, but kind of discretize and, and analyze things. And the parasympathetic system needs repose and tranquility and recognizability, right? It needs uniformity. So you have both of these systems, they both need to be stimulated, and there are obviously differences in you know, how different people might seek to stimulate these, but, but they're there. So the idea that you could have a system of beauty, given how deeply felt beauty is, that completely does away with novelty, that's very repetitious, seems flawed from this neurological point of view, but equally, the idea that it should always be completely different, completely unpredictable, and there is no uniformity to it, there is no pattern to it, again, runs against uh, what we know about our nervous system. So you know, music is a great example, especially classical music. You know, the notes repeat, the notes, uh, the, the, if you were to measure the, the frequency, the vibrations of the notes, there are recognizable and fairly fixed ratios. But you don't want to repeat the same notes over and over and over identically again. So if you get a, a piece by Bach, you know, they repeat, but there's a slight variation each time, right? Otherwise, it'd be dead dull. So you have uniformity within variety. So there's plenty of variety, but there's also underlying that something that's recognizable and uniform. So let's give some examples of painting. So this is a painting by Murillo, which I think is the most humane painter probably of all times. And, and that's one by Monet, who you know, was obviously very concerned with light and color, and to some extent, proportions and framing. And you can see that they appeal to emotion, but it's mediated by recognition, a sense of, you know, you look at them and it's beautiful, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's not necessarily always happy, but it is meaningful and earnest. It's not a joke. And you know, it doesn't yell at you, it doesn't grab you. You just look at it and you observe it. And then you have something that stimulates more our sympathetic system that challenges maybe, you know, always looking at the same things. Something like by Pollock or Rothko. I'm actually not quite sure what Rothko does. There's actually slightly <laughs> different color, but it's not just very, very dark blue. There's some black at the edges. But you know, the point is that this, this challenges you, right? This doesn't, this is kind of like, ah, you know, nobody looks at one of those paintings and goes like, oh, this was really pretty. You know, this, it reminds me of my mom, no. <laughs> you know? oh, I remember that garden we used to go to, no, this is like, well, I don't know what that reminds you of. Oh, so, some very, very bad part, although it is club colors. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, very good. By the way, Pollock has actually been examined in mathematics for the fractional, for the Hausdorff dimension, and it's actually been found to have a fractional Hausdorff dimension. The chap was genuinely, yeah, so semi random. No, you, yeah. Unlike most humans. Right. So now, and he worked quite hard at it actually, it wasn't accidental. Oh, yeah. um, architecture, another example. So you look, this is the, the Royal Naval College at Greenwich, you know. Here, what you're seeing here is some rules of order and scale and recognizability, right? Because you're using a lot of classical devices, which by this point are part of our um, cultural canon. Uh, you know, you're using stone that's comparatively local, or at least, you know, so there's a lot there that a cultured person at the time and even now would recognize. And there's some symmetry, and so that's parasympathetic. This is where the sympath. So here you see Libraskin. Libraskin is trying to do the opposite. He's talking to your parasympathetic, to your sympathetic system. You're like, whoa, you know, the windows are just any old place. Where's the entrance? We don't know. <laughs> you know, is there one floor that goes all the way through this building? Probably not. Doesn't matter. You know, is it alien? Is it human? We don't know. It's interesting, right? Um, is it beautiful? That's that's more debatable. Sympathetic and parasympathetic visuals. Um, a very good way of thinking of these two systems, system, not so much system one and system two, but sympathetic and parasympathetic, is the famous um, oriental symbol, which yes, I think is 2,000 years old, something like that, the yin and the yang, right? So you have this dual, and the point of the yin and the yang isn't just that you have duality, you have chaos and order, again, uniformity and variety, parasympathetic and sympathetic, obviously they didn't have those terms back in, in the Han Dynasty, but um, 
but the fact that they have to balance and that they partly contain each other. Um, that you have to have some tradition, but you also have some transformation and growth. And I think that's where the objectivity subjectivity that people perceive uh, perhaps uh, excessively in the idea of beauty comes from. Because in the, in the yin yang, obviously they're perfectly balanced. They're the same size, they're opposite each other, they're perfectly black or white or red and white, depending. Uh, but you know, we're messier, real people are messier than that. And so some people maybe, you know, have a, I was gonna say a smaller yin or a larger yang. No. Uh, you know, they have a different balance, a different equilibrium. Some people will, will be more open to more sympathetic stimulation, the surprise, the wild, the different. And some people will need or, or grow to need, perhaps with, time, with age, you know, more of a sense of recognizability and legibility and, and, and emotional connection. Um, so the fact that we need some balance is objective in our, in our perceptions and in how we interpret, um, especially how we interpret relatively abstract things like beauty, I believe is objective and I think that there's plenty of scientific evidence. But it's not objectivity in the sense that every single person should like this painting and every single person should dislike this painting or they're wrong. It's just that if you take it to either extreme, you're unlikely to produce beauty. <clears throat> and so for instance, these are two paintings by two of my favorite Spanish authors, uh, painters, the ones from Soraya and Picasso. I like this painting better for a number of reasons, which actually are incidental to my background, our history, you know, what we were taught in school when we were little kids, we were shown this relentlessly, right? <laughs> Growing up in Italy, you can imagine. Uh, this one, not so much. This, this, I think, is objectively more beautiful. This is probably more relevant. It's probably more interesting from many points of view. It's more unique within his body of work. So Raya painted many paintings on that theme. This is one of his best ones. But I think I would like to challenge you to start thinking whether it's possible perhaps to think that you like this painting better and it's a more important painting in the history of art and the history of our culture, but this is a more beautiful painting. So a more narrow definition of beauty, a less conflationary definition of beauty. Not beauty as something I really like, you know? Um, okay. Third and last, and hopefully people will not completely be falling asleep now. Correlation is not causation, yeah, but you can't have causation without some evidence of correlation. In fact, that's how you usually establish causation. So it's saying correlation is not causation is really being a bit simplistic and just kind of sweeping it all under a rug. So from the late 18th century, people started pointing out that there's a lot of spurious causality. When you see something happening at the same time, like ice cream sales going up and violent crime, well, obviously, no. I mean, that's an easy one. I mean, we, we figure that it's not the ice cream that's making people commit crimes, but, you know, it but they happen at the same was, time. It was in Glasgow, actually. <laughs> 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 Maybe you take the ice cream away <laughs> when it's hot. Uh, or the precedence. So this happens, and then after that, this always happens, right? So the rooster crows, and the sun comes up. Um, and we understand pretty well that we can have a confounding variable, so, you know, in cases like this, we, we figure out that you know, the rooster just can sense the, the, the light coming up before humans do, and, and you know, ice cream sales are when it's hot, and when it's hot, people commit more violent crime, and all kinds of crime, actually. But, um, but if we were unsure about this, the way we would establish it in our modern scientific episteme is with a scientific method, right? So, okay, let's just stop ice cream sales next summer. Let's just forbid ice cream and see if crime goes down. Well, it probably would go up, but it certainly wouldn't go down because the ice cream is so okay. So that would, that's an experimental method. We control for one variable. Uh, or, you know, an easier experiment to do without causing a revolution. Uh, <laughs> you can really easily make roosters crow much earlier. Just put in a very bright room and they start crowing. You know, any time of night. Uh, th this was an early experiment done by, uh, by, by, I think Descartes actually did that. Uh, but. <clears throat> so early on in the analytical uh, philosophical revolution. Um, because people were saying, well, you can't prove that that's not linked. And I was like, well, yeah, I can, because I can make him pro and the sun still comes up at the same time. Um, now, you can't always try an experiment, right? Some things are, are 
um, difficult to convince people to do or unethical or so forth, or you just don't have the data. And so there are other two ways of establishing, um, of using correlation to establish causation without falling into the, uh, into the trap of, uh, of spurious causation. The first one is statistical inference, but it only works, it's quite easy, but it only works in certain cases. The second one is simulated intervention, and this is an interesting advance because this really only has come as being applied uh, broadly, especially in epidemiology and medical sciences, now incre increasingly in all other sciences, since the 1990s. So it's very new. In my field of economics, most people are still blithely ignorant of this. And simulated intervention is a actually deceptively simple way. It's a bit like Pythagoras' theorem. Once you see it, it's like, oh yeah, obviously, but yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that in a tri three million years, right? I, I don't know, they'd have to teach it to me. Uh, simulated intervention allows you by probability decomposition to simulate experimental data, you know, experimental is when you change things, from observational data, just the data that what happened. Uh, and that's really powerful. So causation, uh, the, sorry, the PDF did something there. Very simple. So imagine I have three variables, wealth, IQ, wealth of your family, IQ, and go, university attendance. Now we know statistically uh, that wealth and university attendance are correlated, and so are IQ and university attendance. However, wealth and IQ are not correlated. Uh, you know, the children of, of rich people are not on average particularly smarter than the children of poorer people. Uh, because intelligence is not very heritable, luckily. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, not, a, not a personal comment, a general one. Uh, now, however, if we control for university attendance, so if you only look at people that wear, so if you control for university attendance, you'll establish a correlation between wealth and intelligence. This is called Bergson's paradox or collider bias. Because the U equal one, the people, people that went to, I'm not sure I spelled plenty, plenty, but obviously, I must have been thinking of Northern Italian food. So, <laughs> 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 uh, so yeah, so the, the subset of people that go to universities has plenty of students that are just clever or just well off, but obviously there are plenty of people that are well off and clever. So that will have a higher, will have some positive correlation and vice versa, the, 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 zero, the U equals zero subset has students that are clever and students that are from well-off families. But if you're well-off and clever, it's unlikely that you're not going to university this day and age. And so that will create a negative correlation there. When that happens, you know, remember when I first started, these were the lines that show correlation. Correlated, correlated, not really strongly correlated, okay? If we have this kind of, sorry. If we can say that these are the correlations, i.e. they're correlated, not correlated, but they are if I control for this, then I can direct the arrows. I can say that these two are causal or predictors of university attendance, parental wealth and IQ. But university attendance is not causal of intelligence because you can't retroactively make you smarter and it certainly can't make your parents richer than you go to university. Now, in a case like this, the fact that this couldn't cause this, so I think we can, you know, we, we can figure that out without statistics, right? As, as, as Pearl says, you're smarter than your data. Uh, but whether wealth and IQ, you know, are they related? You know, that does it. How does it, you know, what role does it play? If you want to, to, to check which role either of these play into getting into university, you need to be able to understand the causality. Right. So these are the three, the various types of ways in which three variables that have some correlation. If you have no correlation at all, then you can't reach no conclusion. Uh, there's, the, there's the collider we just, we just talked about, right? Two causes into one effect. And then you have the fork, which is one cause into two effects. And obviously the correlations are the opposite. X and Y, X and Z are correlated, but if you control um, for Y, they're not. And the reason they're correlated usually is because they're both caused by the same thing or they're influenced by the same thing. But if you control for that, they're not so correlated anymore. And then you have a chain in which the correlation, this, this, this masks this. So if you control for this, X is not correlated to Z anymore because you're blocking out that information essentially. Um, there is a very, Nifty, again, I wouldn't have come up with it in a million years. Algorithm, they say, great, you got three series. Uh, clever, right, whatever. I could have done that without all this stuff. Sometimes you're look, looking at hundreds or dozens, and there's a really clever algorithm somebody came up with uh, in AI that can uh, see if you can resolve all the correlations 
into these different shapes. A lot of times you can't, especially with real life or, or human agency data. So the other way is causation by intervention, right? So what do we mean by intervention? Uh, you have a strong and stable covariance between barometer readings and rain, right? When it reads you know, low, usually, off, very often it rains, not always. And sometimes the rain comes quickly, so it never got a chance to read low, you know, and it rains before it turns to low. But generally, they're very highly correlated. Now, we suspect that it's not the barometer that makes the rain fall. So we could prove it. We can intervene. We can take all the barometers and glue the hand to fair and see if it stops raining. <laughs> and if we do that, we, you know, it still rains sometimes. So the barometer does not cause rain, okay? Now, first of all, it would be possible to run this experiment thoroughly because you, you don't know there's some barometer you don't know about in someone's house that's still making it rain, right? Also, people might mind if you ruin their hundreds of barometers all over the country, right? <laughs> Thousands of barometers. Okay, so how do we simulate this intervention if we don't want to do it? Um, there's a thing called the do operator. So um, this is, I, I hope I won't bore you too much, but this just means the probability of rain occurring, given that the barometer says low, will be some, you know, we can measure that, right? Observationally, it'll be 95%, say, so that's P1. What is the probability of rain occurring if we set the barometer too low? Not just let it behave like it wants. It'll be a different probability, right? Right? Because it'll be a lot lower than 95%. Because it'll always be low, and sometimes it doesn't rain. So it'll be like, I don't know, 35%, P2. So if P2 is much lower than P1, we can deduce that through correlations that, uh, that the barometer does not cause the rain. Okay? Um, and vice versa, if if you intervene and you raise the probability, right? Imagine that we glued the, the barometer hands and hands. It's always raining <laughs> every time. Then, then, then we prove for sure. You're making a presumption that the numbers from the barometer are actually different to the physical interpretation of the barometer itself. And if, because the point is, is you're cha just changing numbers in a table here. No, 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 no. I'm sticking the barometer. I'm literally making the barometer read what yeah, I so want. So you haven't gone around the whole country and glued all barometers. Right, which is why I have to find something clever to do. Um, but imagine that I could. Yeah, yeah, but the problem is, is what you're presuming is that the reading from the barometer is, uh, associ is, is the issue. That number, the, the, that set of that's tables. That's exactly what I'm assuming. You're the that's what I'm trying to test. Exactly, and this is utterly, it could be pixies. It could be the actual barometer the, the, that happens uh, to have the lead here. No, the point is that, that could if, if the lever, the quantum state to the of lever, the the lever does not make a rain. The quantum state, the quantum state of the barometer is entangled with the quantum state of the weather. And this quantum is physics, as you know, is not applicable to any physical thing that is measurable in, in socioeconomic senses. Uh, apart from your uh, phone. Yeah. Well. Because it's run by transistors, which are quantum mechanics. Oh, sure. But, but. But I so every time I switch it, it, it does it. Anyway, that's... Yeah. Um, so how, 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 how do you glue the barometer hands without gluing the barometer hands? You, this is how you do it. So I'll give an example. This is, this, is, this is a slide. So this is simply saying, we know from Mr. Bay, from the Reverend Bayes, sorry, that the probability of X taking this value, taking this value, that this value, given the causality, or maybe we're testing the causality, so we want to see if that's the case, this is the probability of x taking a given value, this one, and then y taking this value given that x has taken that value, right? Because that influences it. And that z takes that value given that y has taken that value, right? Now, if we set y to lowercase y, that's a different probability, okay? The probability of do y given x, x doesn't matter anymore. We've glued the thing, or we've changed, we intervened physically. That would be one. So this probability, px do yz as opposed to px yz, is just px times pzy, because this term becomes one. Now we can't measure this. If we don't glue the barometer hands, we cannot measure this. So how do we find that out? Well, we can measure these observationally and this, right? And so we find that this probability is the same as this divided by that. That's a very simple version. The generalized formula is this one. 
Of course it is! Collie! my gin and tonic! Okay. <laughs> now, some people at this point say, in statistics, some Pearsonian statisticians say, well, that's why we control for things. Controlling is not the same as intervening, right? So probability Z do Y X is not the same as probability of Y given X, okay? Because uh, this probability is one. This one usually typically will be one. If, if you're in a state where that's the case, then the intervention is pointless. <coughs> Controlling for a variable Y, you know, being within a certain range or having a certain value, means that you take the probability distribution of Z given whatever and over, over X only in those cases where y took on this value. When you're intervening, you're, right, which means that you're cutting out some of the states of x. When you're intervening on y being this, you're looking at the distribution of z given lowercase y over the entire case data for, for x, the entire distribution. So it's a different probability. And you're free to go. That's <laughs> <laughs> all those are all the Best thing so far. Many thank you. Many thanks, Luca. Any questions? <laughs> what was that again? Will you explain the last ten minutes, please? <laughs> so, I have a three and a half hour presentation on that. <laughs> right. uh, do you have examples of real world things you can apply this theory to? Causal inference. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's difficult to bring it to life with that few slides and, and, and the data. But um, one of the things, one of the things that um, has been debated in economics quite a bit is in terms of uh, the European Central Bank's monetary policy. Is you know, like a lot of central banks, they say they want to do X. You know, I'm I'm, I'm pursuing this policy because I want to achieve this end state. And they keep pursuing that policy, and that end state doesn't happen. So you think, well, are they thick? I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they have 600 economics PhDs, and one of them must realize this isn't working. Right? So one of the things is, well, maybe they're saying they're pursuing you know, the policy because of this objective, but maybe they're pursuing the other objective. Right? And so you can put that in a relatively rich causal framework, where you say, OK, you see policy is the ultimate load. And you say, OK, this is the thing they always talk about, inflation. We're trying to get inflation above, you know, two percent or slightly above. Well, we're pushing a piece of string, it's not working. Okay, but they might be trying to do some other things as well. So let's see how these other things are going, how the causality works. But these things are also connected to each other. And you know, typically in economics, because people say correlation, you know, oh, is not. But people in, in social sciences attribute causation to correlation without doing this kind of homework all the time, right? The way you build your model, you have your independent variables because you've decided they're independent, and you're dependent variable, right? Um, it's not very robust, especially in economics with often some feedback loops. So the frustrating things for this in economics is very often your algorithm doesn't work. You know, the correlations are fairly loose to begin with, and so you can't come to a, you know, shatteringly clear conclusion, you know, based on, 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 on so-called Newtonian <laughs> statistics. But, um, but, um, in many cases, uh, I think it can, it can be very helpful. And in that case, uh, if you apply this framework to that problem, it's very clear that this should be, which many people suspect it, but if you have stronger evidence, let's say, um, the ECB uh, doesn't keep rates low to get inflation up. It keeps rates low to keep even from blowing up. Right? Uh, and you can demonstrate it almost mathematically, uh, as opposed to being a you know, reasonable opinion. Um, this research was used um, to show there was almost certainly causation, it's a more complex application of this, uh, between smoking and cancer. When the evidence of a very strong correlation between smoking and, and lung cancer came to evidence, and it was very strong by the late 30s, early 40s, but by the late 40s it was obvious. I mean, the, you know, the data was very strong, let's put it this way. And the tobacco guys kept saying there could be a confounding variable that could be a genetic predisposition to liking to smoke, and that same genetic profile makes you likely to get lung cancer. Right? And so mm -hmm. they use what they call a proxy variable in the middle. They say, okay, but we know that 
again, through correlation and direct observation, that almost no one that doesn't smoke, basically no one that doesn't smoke, has, has tar deposits in their lungs. If you don't smoke, you don't have discount tar deposits in your lung. And there's a big correlation between those tar deposits and cancer. Right? So it, it's more complex than the way I've just described it. You know, that's showing a few formulas and stuff. But it was also used uh, when the uh, University of California, Berkeley, was trying to determine whether women were being discriminated against in admission policy. Women were less likely to be admitted. So you know, that lower percentage of applicants were admitted into Berkeley in the 1960s and 1970s. But of course, there's a lot of factors, right? They got lower grades, for instance. Maybe they're stupid, right? Whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so they tried to include a number of different variables and see how they correlated to each other and try to build a. So now, you, some direction of correlation was, we could say again, using Perl, you're smarter than your data. You know, being intelligent can't change your set, can't make you a woman, right? Mm -hmm. These days, but at that time, it was considered that a woman was a woman and a man was a man, with very rare occasions. You know, the kids are not for decision, but I mean, generally speaking, it was, it was you know clear cut. And going to university wouldn't change your gender, and, and so on and so forth. And so they looked at this problem, uh, and the way the causality ran uh, using this this system, and you know it did emerge that yes, although being female, for instance, had an impact on your grades at different high school grades, but they might have been, you know, so maybe they were discriminated against in high school, but that wasn't Berkeley's fault if the teachers at high school were giving them lower grades. All they could see is girls got lower grades than this guy, so they looked at him. So they were looking at a really, really rich panel of statistics, and they're able to show, I think, quite conclusively that there was a degree of discrimination. And that's been applied to a lot of cases like that in the law. The interesting thing about it is that almost it usually proves there is some discrimination, which makes the people that don't believe there's discrimination angry. But it almost always usually proves that it's not nearly as much as you think it is if you are you know, lobbying against discrimination, which makes the other set of people very angry. So you go with an answer, it sure, no, no, makes, makes no one happy. Because Berkeley and say, for lack, for lack of a better term, conservatives say, oh, there's no discrimination. And like, yes, there is. And, and the people on the other side are like, it's completely corrupt, it's complete discrimination. Like, no, it's, it's about this much, and that much is not. Okay, you. a lot of very, very, yeah. um, in epidemiology and uh, um, <clears throat> generally the study of ecosystems now, this is very, very heavily used. In economics and social sciences, unfortunately, not so much. I think two reasons. One is that we're always behind and stuff like this. We're wildly behind, 30 years behind. B, it's a field where, you know, increasingly, but so I think it's always been the case, but increasingly a lot of people can start with the conclusion that they'll find out. So this is dangerous as hell. And the last reason that it's not used very much is that having worked with it for about a couple of years now, uh, the correlations and, and the data in those fields is not never as clean as you know, physical sciences or biology. And so a lot of times, you know, the, 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 the final answer is in, it's not really clear. So, you know, it's not satisfying. Well, thank you very much, Luca. Um, Sorry. Um, I forgot to mention there's a card of condolence on the bar for Pru team, which we'll be sending to his family later. Thanks for all you who will be watching at home. I uh, hope the stream works. If it didn't, or you couldn't make out any of the tiny numbers on the screen, uh, I have been recording it and I will upload it in higher resolution than this in a day or two's time. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's